Ladies and gentlemen, I wonder if you even know what was the most valuable experience of today. And I hope at the end of my talk, I may leave you with a different view on your personal hygiene. But in between, I'm going to take you to a circular economy. A circular economy, I'm, going to, I'm so sick and tired of this crisis, of this financial crisis, that is really just a symptom of something much larger. We're on a system crisis. We are using our planet completely wrong. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of the necessity of thinking about this. This may be part of the fear that we talked about. But I want to go to the solution side of it, and that will be the second part. So if we look at the area of land and water ecosystems that we need to provide us with everything we want, all the consumption and all the waste that needs to be assimilated, then that's a certain, you can calculate that. Well, that's all very well per citizen, but we're not doing that. We're living, in Dutch we say we live on, on a too big a foot. I, I don't think that's a good, very British expression. But um, for that, as an ecologist, my heart bleeds because we're, we're actually destroying these ecosystems. And these ecosystems are really something that we as human beings, but all other animals and plants and organisms on this planet need. These ecosystems give us services that we don't even know until we lose them. So that's not what we want. And you know the signals. I can go through it, and it's always the same, and it's in every newspaper. Already we need 1.3 planet, as it is now. And we know that it's just a beginning, because the rest of the world would love to have our consumption pattern right that we have in the West. I'm not blaming the Americans only, it's also the Europeans, and of course, China, India are coming up strong. Energy is not the real problem at all. We think about that all the time. That's a political choice. Oil is a political choice. What's really the problem is that we live in the wrong economy. We have a linear economy, an economy we take something, we make something out of it, and we throw it away. Okay? And that linear economy must go out of your brain now, and something else has to come into your brain. So we know these fossil fuels are finished, but who cares? Really, who cares? There's a lot more examples I can give you, and I give you a few. In your cell phone, there is a metal tantalum, and it comes from the Colton mines. And here you see we have about 116 years left of Colton. But we only have 20 years left if everybody would have that same cell phone on this world. And it's a key motive for the, sev for the civil war, for example, in Congo, where the Colton mines are. The ownership of the gold mines and the diamonds and the, and the Colton mines, that's what it's all about. So it has a global effect, the fact that you want to have your, your um, mobile phone. Copper, another example, we use it all the time, 39 years left. Prices are booming. Now they drop because of the economic crisis, but they'll go up straight up, and no wonder we have thieves going around that are stealing copper or bronze from our uh, museum. But one resource that should be on the political agenda and is not is phosphorus. Phosphorus, without phosphorus, no organism, no plant or animal can grow. It's in your DNA, it's your energy machine, it's in every cell, it's in your bones, and we're destroying it. We're mining it, and we have a limited amount on this planet. We're mining it, we put it in our fertilizer, it's a crucial factor in our uh, artificial fertilizers, we throw it on the land, it gets wasted. And you think, phosphorus? I thought we had too much phosphorus. Yes, we have too much phosphorus here, and we throw it in our lakes, and we have the algal blooms. But worldwide, we're actually disturbing and breaking through that phosphorus cycle, and we shouldn't. It's a very important thing, and we only have 75 to 80 years left. And then it's gone. Okay. Now, what you see happening, of course, is that the production levels are going down. In the United States, shown here, prices are booming, uh, and it's going to happen more. In 80 years' time, we're not going to be able to feed all these people because we're not going to have any, any artificial fertilizer. We must do something about it. And we know it's in our bones, and it's in our feces. 
and also in yours and in your urine. Why don't we do anything about it? So we can look at it as a problem, but I hate problems. We can look at it as a challenge. If it's a problem, it's not in my backyard. I don't have anything to do with it. I don't want a wind tunnel in my backyard. But if it's a challenge, it's my wind tunnel. Bring it close to the people. Make it a local event. Make it a together event. Then you can do it. And then, as an ecologist, I want to tell you there are lessons from ecology that we can learn. Lesson number one, in nature there's no waste, all nutrients cycle. Everything's broken down and becomes available. So why not do that? Why not do that for everything that you produce? Why mix up metals so we can never get them apart? We should keep copper into copper into copper forever. That's just a different design. You recognize the cradle to cradle concept in here from Michael Braungart and Bill McDonough. Okay. So we should have a circular economy. The essence of a circular economy is that you have the biological cycle, you have the technical cycle. You can make products, all kinds of processes, as long as they can come back to the cycles. And at least there is a system barrier of the amount that we have. And there are a lot of people on this world, and there, we may reach those system boundaries, but we can do a hell of a lot better than we do now. Uh, we, we have all these m minerals that the farmers have to get rid of, CO2, their heat, we can give them to algae. Algae are wonderful things. They're little plants without roots, without leaves. All they do is produce biomass. And uh, they use CO2 and sun and, and some minerals. And the algae can go back to the cattle. It's just a circular economy. Lesson number two. Energy comes from the sun. It's our, why is this planet green? Because of the sun. Okay, why do we, why don't we use it fully? Here you see the earth. I wonder if you can see it right there. This giant sun is out there. The sun will be for millions of years available for our energy. But it's a choice. It's a choice that you make. And I have to say this in the same terms I can say uranium. If we build all these nuclear power plants, we have 19 years left of uranium. It's a resource that's limited. So why do that? It's an old technique. We shouldn't be doing that. We're in the era of the life sciences. Information technology goes fast, but the life sciences and biology is leading. Absolutely. We can do so much. Now, we have this horrible discussion about biodiesel that you know. We are producing corn and the tortillas in Mexico are becoming more expensive because we want to put it in our cars. What a stupid idea. We get 172 uh, liters per acre uh, out, of, out of corn or out of sunflower. Look at algae. Look at microalgae here. Today, we already have 18,800 liters compared, and we do not compete with any agricultural soil that we could use for food production. It's just a choice. Of course, you need to innovate further, but to say it's not a, a chance, it's an enormous chance. All kinds of bio-inspired systems. We can make artificial leaves. We can actually improve on photosynthesis. Natural selection and nature has photosynthesis, but they kind of make some silly sugars at the end. We're engineers. We can fix that problem. We can make it much better. Here we have some cyanobacteria. They're photosynthesizing bacteria that catch the sun, CO2, and actually, without making biomass, can make it into butanol or whatever. A complete fuel system built, built uh, by biological by organisms. Okay, so you can make energy out of plants, the roots of plants. It's just, there are tons of those innovations. I could only put in a few of these examples. Lesson number three, diversity. In nature, there is not one solution, one solution for, the, for a problem. There are many solutions. Not one solution fits all. And our economy is completely mono. Everything is dominated by large monocultures with lots of insect pests. Mono everything. Sick and tired of it. Make it local. Make it completely uh, an innovation. Share this knowledge. Get these professors out of their ivory towers. 
Use local resources, bring it to the people, use the competences that you have when you have a crowd of people together. And then think global, but act local. So that's what we're doing. We have a research institute in three places in the country, in Eerseke, in Nieuwersluis and in Hetere. And we're bringing together two of the centers in a new building in Wageningen, close to the university. We are the Academy of Science. Institute, You know, they have 19 institutes, we're one of them. And, and we really want to show that science and technology and also the community, uh, we, we can do something. We see this new building as a system where we purify the water, where we don't want the sewage system, I'll come back to that, where we use solar income, where we use the people um, uh, and around us at the university as well to bring in their innovations. We want a building that is evolving and that is a learning building. So that's what we're doing. We're having great uh, green roofs. We have um, actual uh, uh, new energy concepts where we store the heat that we get from the buildings, from the greenhouses, uh, from solar thermal into deep into the soil and we work together with, uh, with companies, and it's very nice. And, of course, we're not going to use the sewage system because we want the phosphorus back. So what we do is we have the newest, and it's a large building, we're going to recover these, these nutrients from our own feces. So if you come and visit our building, you must leave something behind. <laughs> okay. And we're going to invite the whole university opposite to come and who with us? Well, anyway, <laughs> the biogas is something nice because if you use the digesters, you can actually get the biogas. So we get some energy from that as well. But it's the algae that we use. We do research on algae. It's the algae that we use because they're so competent in getting phosphorus and potassium and nitrogen, all these wonderful minerals, out of it. And then we can give it back to the land. Okay? Somebody says, a lot of people say, you're absolutely crazy, why do you do this, you know, and there's nothing as conservative as the building industry. Uh, without pilots, I say, there is no innovation. We take a lot of risks, and it's the only way you can do it, okay? I think there is so much competence out there. I know a lot of people that want to join. Actually, I have to say no all the time rather than getting them in. It is really time for this Green New Deal. Let's forget about these problems. You don't want to be part of the problem. You want to be part of the, I don't even say the solution, because if you talk about solutions, you already have a problem, right? You go to the beginning and you design so that you don't have a problem. That is also the essence of Cradle to Cradle. A lot of people say, yeah, you know, we're doing so well, we're reducing these toxins and we're reducing, you know, the misery. Yeah, okay. That's because you had it in the first place. Why not go to the beginning and take care that you do not have it in the first place? I think it's a new challenge to mankind. After the fire that we discovered, after agriculture, 10,000 years ago, that could structure our societies. Then we had the industri industrialization, where we had resources enough and we didn't care about what effects it really had. It wasn't so noticeable. But with 9 billion people, it will be very noticeable how we do it. And it's a great challenge now to do it differently. So. Amazing, I have a remaining time, yes. And uh, I just want to say, the pot of gold is not <laughs> at the end of the rainbow. It's all in you. Okay, thank you.